give the opening welcome. Thank you, Nuru. Um, very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Suryani Suryaman from the Department of Malay Studies, NUS. And I would like to welcome all of you to the book launch of Arok of Java, a translation of Arok Dejes by Kamudia and translated by Max Lane. Uh, this event is organized by the Department of Malay Studies, NUS, to, um, with the support of Horizon Books as well as National Library. The Department of Malay Studies is very pleased to organize this book launch. So let me now um, call upon Professor Syed Farid Alakas, Head of the Department of Malay Studies, to open this evening's event with his welcome address. Professor Syed Farid Alakas. This is not something that Singapore is known for. But there is, there, there has been for a long time now some of such discourse. And it's quite interesting that, uh, that a lot of this began in the Malay Studies Department. Um, the Malay Studies Department is one of the oldest departments in the uh, uh, university, in the National University of Singapore, um, in comparison with, in, relative to the other social science and humanities departments. Um, and from its very inception, um, it, you could say that it started with this kind of critical discourse. For example, a critique of, uh, of Raffles came out of the Malay Studies Department. A book, a uh, critical work on Raffles was actually written by my late father, Sankar like Sankaratas. Um, and he wrote other uh, works that were of a critical uh, nature in a very fundamental way. Um, and there were others in the Malay Studies Department who uh, also did um, some critical kinds of histories and sociologies of uh, not just uh, Singapore society, but Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, I'm mentioning this because the work of Pramodia, of course, is of that genre. It's critical and it has inspired and continues to inspire um, um, several generations of uh, Indonesian uh, scholars to read, interpret, the history um, and to sort of uh, engage in the critique of uh, Eurocentric and Orientalist discourses. Um, and um, we are looking forward to um, learning more about this, uh, certainly in the department. Um, but we are also looking forward, uh, certainly, to the further impact of this work in the, not just in Indonesia, but beyond Indonesia, the region, and, and elsewhere. Um, but that's all I'd like to say, uh, just to sort of put everything in context. Um, but I do, um, along with the rest of you, look forward to the remarks that are going to be made by Max Lane and Brazil um, uh, later on, as well as the discussion that will be followed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Farid. Pramodya Nanta Toa was a prominent Indonesian intellectual and author of novels, short stories, 
essays, and histories of his homeland and his people. Born in 1925, <coughs> he was imprisoned for 15 years, first under the Dutch and then under Suharto. It was during his imprisonment on the island of Buru that saw the production of the series of four novels, often referred to as the Buru Tetralogy, um, which chronicle the development of Indonesian nationalism. Pramudia's death in April 2006 is considered a great loss in world literature. To talk about Pramodia and his sense of history, I would like to invite Dr. Razik Bahri from NIE at Nanyang Technological University, whose book entitled Pramodia Postcolonially, Reviewing History, Gender and Identity in the Buru Tetralogy, that came out of the PhD thesis, has just, which has just been published yeah, this year. Dr. Razik Bahri. share with you some thoughts I have on Ram's work. Um, having studied the Guru Tetralogy some 13 years ago, it seems uh, like an opportune time now to open it up again to reconsideration and perhaps uh, reassess some of my ideas um, on Indonesia's leading prose writer. At the same time, there are compelling contexts for a rethink about where we would situate Ramundi's writing today. There is in fact, uh, there is the fact that since the revival of interest in his work in the late 1980s, early 1990s, spurred by the publication of the first English translation of the Guru Tetralogy by Tango in Australia, thanks to Max Lane sitting over there, Ramundi's works have enjoyed a flourish of re reprints and republications. A string of honors and awards conferred on him has also been um, has also been equally impressive. Pen Freedom to Write Award in 1988, Fund for Free Expression Award in 1989 from the United States, the Stitch Thing World Time Award from the Netherlands in 1995, Maxi Award from the Philippines, uh, Knight Order of Arts and Literature from France, and so on and so forth. Um, he has been nominated as a perennial candidate for the Nobel Peace Prize for Literature since 1981, but he's not won it yet. Um, perhaps posthumously, uh, he might win it one day. His fiction has been translated into 24 languages. Um, I googled uh, this today and I found out that uh, it has now, uh, his works have, uh, have now been translated into, uh, in uh, 40 languages. So these accolades seem due recognition for the sustained quality of his work over more than half a century. For the rigor and incisive nature of his historical vision, the authority of his presence as a writer, and the formal and technical mastery of his writing. This constellation of awards and recognition coming fast and furious as they did in the twilight years of the new order were another kind of vindication of the triumph of art over oppression of the ethics of writing in the context of uh, draconian state stratagems of uh, silencing and sensorial control, of bearing the truths of the past, its implication for the present, and imagining alternative futures. In conferring these awards, the world is recognizing in its own due and reasonable time what many already knew. For years, Brown's work has attracted an ever-increasing body of admirers, readers who value his writing for its immediacy, and its extraordinary insight into the inner history and historical consciousness of Indonesia. There are, co there are compelling reasons for rec uh, to reconsider the world of Pram's fiction in the altering lights of recent developments. Since May 1998, after months of student-led mass demonstrations, widespread civil unrest, rioting and public pressure which led to the fall of Suharto's new order, there have been extraordinary changes in the Indonesian political setting and the country has reached a critical new stage. Since 1998, Indonesia has had four presidents. 
Suharto's departure arguably brought freedom and changes. And yet, no sooner had this world been entered than it began to seem perhaps more complex, a more complex place than expected. The immediate past would not disappear overnight. The legacies of Suharto's authoritarian rule, political, economic, cultural, the disastrous states of education and housing, this could not and would not be transformed by one heavy moment of magic. Perhaps the new order was in some sense reinvented, if not in legalistic terms, then in other social, political and economic forms. In fact, Pramodia, ever the incorrigible critic, regarded Habibi's short-lived interim government and the self-styled reformist government of President Abdurrahman Wahid as being no different from Suharto's new order regime, flippantly co coining the term Orbani.